Welcome to another show of the Research to Reps Roundtable. I am your co-host, Dr. Coach Pat Ivey, and I'm really excited about this episode. Ted, Dr. Ted Lambernitas. Ted, how you doing? I'm doing great, Pat. Looking forward to uh, today's podcast. I think we're going to get some great insights uh, from an NBA perspective that I don't think we've had for a while. Exactly, and I uh, can't wait to see what tricks Dr. Reimer pulls out underneath his sleeves dr reimer what's going on um you know what it's football season it's football season <laughs> that's what's going on and dr ivy and i met dr jared boyd at a conference in notre dame and and he just um he just dropped the mic really literally dropped the mic at that event and we had to have him on the podcast jared we're excited you're here. Welcome. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what's happening in your world right now? Yeah, for sure. I appreciate you all for having me on. And, and man, I, I enjoy you all's presentation as well, Notre Dame, especially the improv that had to happen with, I guess, the power going out a little bit. So you guys did an exceptional job. Uh, but for me, I am actually currently, which I've never experienced, uh, getting over jet lag. So I went to, just got back from Hawaii, first time there, uh, two days ago, was out there with with an athlete, just continuing up with his reconditioning process prior to us getting into open gym and, and training camp. And the flight from Hawaii back to Memphis was an eight hour flight from Hawaii to, to Atlanta, and then a two and a half hour layover, and then from Atlanta to Memphis. So I'm still kind of disoriented, uh, so apologies if my answers aren't as, as crisp, uh, as I would like them to be, but yeah, the jet lag is, is super interesting and I probably didn't, uh, do the correct things to maybe set myself up for, for success, but, um, getting a little, getting a little, a little better, but otherwise, um, just really trying to make sure with the season starting up that we're just getting all parties on the same page and we can kind of roll in the same direction. We, we've added a lot of new people to our staff this off season. Uh, obviously we've made some changes with the roster as well. So uh, there's a lot of moving parts, but looking forward to seeing kind of where we go and making sure that we continue to reach our, our vision and, and our mission, ultimately trying to win a championship. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I'm sure you will be just as sharp as you were uh, on the stage presenting. Uh, I have no doubts about that. Um, but Dr. Reimer, you said it's football season. I know it's football season. Um, but why would you say that when our guest has so much ex expertise and experience with basketball? Well, usually you ask how I'm doing, and I talk about my men's baseball season. So I just I just thought that, you know, I would, you know, mention that it's football season. But if you would like to know, if you'd like to know, <laughs> um, my men's baseball team got first place in the regular season and then the playoffs start next week. Like we absolutely cleaned house 17 and three. And that's impressive. The playoffs start next week. But um, you said your vision and mission and, you know, you want to win a basketball championship. So um, I love how you talked about, you know, getting everyone to row in the same direction. Um, you've got new staff. You've got a lot of new players. So um, talk to me about, like, in the NBA, how do you bring your staff together and align them to a common vision and mission so that you can increase your chances of winning that NBA final? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's one that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, did you just recently – have a, a paper that came out with respect to collaboration and, and interdisciplinary kind of relationships. Is that is that correct? We did. We did. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. That's on that's on my docket. I got a lot of I got a lot of papers that I need to read uh over the next few weeks. But to answer your question, it is uh it's it is quite challenging, but I think it's challenging in a fulfilling way because it's something that's vital to to the progress and it's really essential with respect to making sure that as cliche as it sounds that the communication the collaboration and the ego in particular is is set aside uh particularly in a high performance setting like the nba where you're going to be surrounded by so many individuals who are 
truly high performers and, and have a lot of domain expertise and, and a lot to bring to the table. And so I think for us, and probably I would hope that this is maybe a ubiquitous statement and that it's important to understand first and foremost, what does the athlete truly need? And so the philosophy that we try to apply here to make sure that everyone can kind of uh, bring the best version of themselves, if you will, or maximize their skill set is this constraints-led approach. And what I mean is that we're looking at what is the rate and limiter or what are the rate and limiters on an athlete's uh, health and or performance. And so if we're able to determine what those constraints or rate limiters are, we can then assign a higher probability of what we should intervene on. And, and therefore, we have then the ability to determine who within a certain department we should leverage to intervene on that constraint. Uh, it doesn't mean that we dismiss any of the other um, qualities uh, and variables that are important, uh, but we might have maybe a primary, secondary, and then a tertiary, if you will, type of uh, process in which we're trying to determine how we how we uh, intervene on those. And so that's one part of the equation is just having an overarching philosophy. And then from there, it is really thinking about with this ego aspect of, well, let's make sure that we have these constant meetings and that when you're when you're having these meetings, it's truly thinking about how to how to listen versus just going right in and saying, oh, this is what I think we should do and going in with, with an immediate answer, if you will. Uh, I think that's helped us quite a bit. Uh, and then the last part I'd say, and I'd be interested to hear you all's thought is, is there's this one, uh, there's a book that I've read, uh, I want to say it was about two years ago. It's called Think Again by Adam Grant. He's an organizational psychologist. I really like a lot of his work. He puts out some fantastic quotes on uh, Twitter and Instagram and that really gets you to think. And a lot of it is geared towards uh, the work environment. And it's an amazing book, but he talks a lot about psychological safety within the workplace. And I think that's important as well. I mean, a lot of our staff has been together for the last four seasons. And so we've just cultivated this environment where if there is a little bit of disagreement, it's not a lot of friction because we know that we're coming from a, a sound place. And that place is, well, what is, who, who has the best answer? And it's not necessarily something where we're berating the individual or their character or their personality. We're essentially trying to say who has the best solution for the problem at hand and the one that is the best rises uh, rises to the level that we're gonna we're gonna use that uh, that person's perspective. So that's kind of maybe some of the variables uh, and considerations that go into making sure we communicate and collaborate and, and there's just a constant uh, influx of information. You can get inundated by a lot. So uh, we 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 really try to make sure that we're just always, whether it's formal or informal, impromptu, not having those candid conversations. But I'd be curious to kind of hear from you all, maybe like what what have you found is if, I guess if I could say the, the secret ingredient, if you will, to trying to make everything gel together in this chaos that is, whether it's professional or collegiate sport. Yeah, professional or collegiate, yeah, that is definitely a question for Ted. Go ahead, Ted. <laughs> I, I what I've uh, that was a double play right there. That was a yeah. <laughs> I don't want to answer this, so throw it to Ted. But uh, what I've found uh, that I think's been beneficial is if the athletes actually see the face-to-face -face collaboration that's occurring. You know, because then they know, um, you know, let's just say that uh, they have a, a particular strength workout today. Hey, just got done talking to Jared. He's going to be taking you through this. We're modifying this. They know that they're the center of the discussion. And it's not like when uh, they come in and the strength coach goes, what did, what did uh, Jared say to you today? That, that you know, so I find when they actually see the face-to-face uh this, you know collaboration and that's communicated directly back to the athlete i think that's where there's just a tremendous amount of trust um for the process that's going on it sounds like that's what's occurring in, in your situation 
Absolutely. I, I like that. The continuity of care. It's funny that you mentioned that, too, because we uh, with this particular case, uh, this reconditioning case that I currently have, um, this is player coming back from from a, a surgery at the end of the season. We've been having intermittent touch points or round tables, if you will, with myself, our sports scientists, and then the strength coach that works with that player. And the player is in those uh, round table discussions so they can hear and kind of really get a tangible idea of what it is that we're trying to uh, that we're trying to accomplish with them and then the tactics and the approaches that we're going to use. And if they feel differently, then we can also make sure that we're to what they have to say and maybe modify and be a little bit more agile in our programming to make sure that uh, we're we're setting them up for success with respect to like their perception and their desires as well. So that's been incredibly important. And the feedback from that athlete was, oh, this is great. Like we need to keep doing this even in the season, uh, let alone it be a, a, a post-surgical uh, type of return to play, but just within the season as well, where again, there is just a lot of chaos. And so it's nice to get a lay of the land and have a, have a good understanding of what to expect week to week from all of the stakeholders that are involved in that player's case. What are some of the challenges in the off season when you have, you know, some of your players throughout the country working with third parties? Um, uh, what are some of the uh, techniques that you found that have been beneficial to, to bring those people in the fold of, of the process you've established? Yeah, that great question. Uh, good one, Ted. So, yeah, I would say that the challenge is trying to ensure that the athlete continues to continues on the path of trying to receive stimuli that achieve specific adaptations that we think are necessary. And the reason we think they're necessary is just because, you know, we can triangulate so much information from the data we have uh, to say, hey, this player's fingerprint or their signature, if you will, on the court, plus their past medical injury history, really signifies that they would be a candidate of this type of method, mean, what have you. And so when they leave in the off season and they go and they train in, you know, Miami or LA, anywhere other than Memphis where the weather's amazing. Um, so they, they go, they go to those places and, and they're training with other, uh, whether it's physical therapists or strength coaches, the challenging part is, making sure that they can continue uh, with some iteration of what they've been doing with us or what we believe to be important. And so I think the tactics that have been helpful to just maybe diffuse any potential uh, friction between parties is letting, letting that, that practitioner or clinician continue to have autonomy within uh, the relationship and within the, the projected uh, programming, but, instead of getting bogged down into the minutia, it's more so saying, hey, this is the, the big bucket, if you will, that we think needs to be filled for this athlete. And then you can apply different means and modes of training for that athlete. But this is the, the primary adaptation that we believe they need. And these are the reasons why. I think when we give those reasons and we keep it relatively broad, it, it, it allows us all to be aligned on the same page. And again, it's still bestows a lot of uh, autonomy for those practitioners as well that's a that's a yeah that's a great question though it, it's it's always it's always challenging and i and, and i wonder right for collegiate level specifically maybe this is probably more pertinent uh to you pat and, and ernie of like with the collegiate level these players you probably get more time with them in the summer to truly adapt the underpinning constituents that are going to help them with performance and, and health versus here, they could be gone for the whole summer. And so now we get back and we really have to kind of do a lot of testing to see, to see where they are, what we need to, to provide. But how does that look for, for you all with respect to once the season ends and then it begins, what's that off season uh, look like? I'll say Ernie. <laughs> I, I was I was waiting to find out if if Pat was going to flip that one over to me or um, so so yeah I mean I mean it, it's different for every sport 
um, some of our sports, we get a lot of work with them in the off season. So uh, your, your fall sports, like say football, um, you get kind of two periods that are pretty solely focused on like strength and conditioning, physical development and, and, um, you know, rehabilitating the athletes, you know, you have time for some, some, uh, mental performance skills development in other areas. And those times would be, you know, six to eight weeks in the uh, early winter. And then uh, you got about eight weeks across the summer. Other fall sports who have the same annual plan with them. Sometimes you're not as privileged to get that summer train block. So you're like your men's and women's soccer and your field hockey, cross country runners, um, volleyball. Some of those athletes will opt to being around during that summer block. And some of them will opt to stay out of town. So, so it can, it can be a little bit tricky, you know, understanding who's here, who's out of town and how you manage those athletes. Uh, then you have your winter sports and um, with some of your winter sports, you are lucky enough to have them around uh, for a summer off season training block. And then before they come back in the fall to start training and getting ready for um, their winter seasons um, and men's and women's basketball, we're lucky enough to have them around. And then you also have your spring sports and a lot of your spring sports, you know, really aren't around during that uh, summer period. But then they, you do still kind of have a bit of an off season with them coming into the fall before they start their official practices going into the, the winter and into their spring season. So it really does vary. And each team, each sport has just a different, a different uh, health and performance team, a different group of people who are working together. Um, where for me um, to be able to get to the level of being able to truly understand like what are those gaps for every athlete? And on the other side, like what are their strengths? A lot of times I think we, we are always looking at opportunities to improve weaknesses, but sometimes you can actually key in on strengths to help like get the ball in the basket, so to speak. Um, because when you think about a, a basketball coach, a lot of times the basketball coach or any sport coach, he's going he's gonna to play into a player's strengths on the field. They're going to play into their, their strengths so that they can – you know, score points and be successful. Whereas off the field, a lot of times we look at the constraints that those players have, um, the rate limiters. But uh, to me, it would be a dream come true to be able to get to a point where we can still maintain that team environment that you like to develop in college, but also really, really hone in and, and provide like what every athlete needs individually. Like really, really that athlete knows that what's being provided to me is unique to me and my needs. And that can be difficult in the collegiate athletic setting. So I got two questions for you, two part. One, like, how do you and your group really circle up and say, like, this is like what this individual needs. And now we're going to move in a direction to leverage different people on our health and performance team and also modify their overall entire programming for that individual. Like, how do you approach that and identify what those needs are objectively, subjectively? And then two, like being someone who works in the NBA, like what recommendations would you have for the collegiate athletics environment to be able to maybe get closer to that? Yeah, I love that question. And it's something that we are continually trying to re refine. And I know that it will continually evolve as well, particularly because we just brought on uh, what I would call a performance or data analyst uh, who is essentially going to help us with the statistics and modeling of different pieces of data and information to to assist in, in forecasting, if you will, uh, adaptations and or potential maladaptation uh, and knowing kind of what variables are the ones that we should be a little bit more oriented towards because that might have the strongest signal. But uh, to answer your question about like what do we have now uh, to be able to use and inform us, I think we have a lot of a lot of data driven or data informed. I want to say I don't really like to say data driven because I think at times by being data driven, you forget the subjective piece and the human interaction uh, that that's incredibly important. Uh, and so I'll say data informed, if you will, and and 
with that, we have a lot of objective means to determine distinct qualities that might be relevant to the performance and or health of specific tissues. And so there's like this tiered approach and with the data that we have and the tests that we perform, because there's so many different tests that are out there. And then within the test, there's different metrics that you can look at as well. And I think the first line of defense is determining, well, what is the prevalence and incidence of certain injuries within a given sport? That's that's one. Uh, and even if it's not an injury, but what what are the locations that this demographic typically uh, complains of pain around? And for NBA, well, you have the knee complex and then you have the ankle. And so we say, all right, well, we, we certainly need some type of objective means to quantify the the capacity, I'll say the impulse generating capacity, the force generating capacity of those particular joints and tissues. Um, and so we look at those and we, we can have norms uh, within our cohort of athletes to determine the capacity or lack thereof at a given joint. But we're also taking into consideration the athlete's past medical history as well. So that goes into the equation of, okay, well, this individual has had multiple ankle sprains, whether we acquired them from a different team or they're incoming from uh, from college. And we can look historically and see kind of their uh, their incidence of, of ankle sprains and say, all right, well, a lot of ankle sprains, we tested them maybe isokinetically uh, with inversion, eversion of the ankle. And those those values were quite low as well. And this is a guard and we run a fast pl pace uh, offense. So that's another part of this equation. Well, what is the style of play uh, that is engendered by the culture of, of your team? Uh, because it's the style of play might bring with it certain types of injuries as well. So we, we run a fast paced uh, offense getting it up and down. So now that potentially places more stress or a higher likelihood of uh, ankle sprain injuries with respect to trying to be invasive and, and more evasive as a point guard. Uh, and so with, with those three things in particular, so we have the objective data, past medical history, and how the team plays, we have a pretty good idea of, of what it is we should prioritize or what that constraint is that we should make sure that we keep our pulse on. But one of the other pieces that is incredibly important too, which I think we often miss is talking to the athlete, right? So what is it that that you feel like you need? Uh, what, what are some things that have worked well for you in the past? What are some things that you felt as though you could have uh, received more of uh, in, in the past? And so we add all of these things into, into the equation to help us to get to a become less wrong, if you will, about what we think the constraint is. And then from there, that's where we essentially brainstorm by looking at the collective consensus uh, uh, regarding the literature on a particular type of constraint or quality that we want to, to derive. But then we also just think about, well, anecdotally as well, what have we done in the past for someone of a similar archetype? Uh, and we, we likely have data or case studies of other athletes that we've used similar types of, of loading schemes for as well. Um, and, and, you know, my, I think the second part of your question, Ernie, was, well, what, what advice would be beneficial to provide to maybe the collegiate world? And to me, I think it, it, it's two big things. One, and I know it's probably challenging. So when I say this, it might be like, well, <laughs> good luck trying to implement that. Uh, but the, the, the first one is really just thinking about when it comes to when it comes to injury or performance, like what are what are the what's, what's, we'll, we'll stick with injury right now. What's the incidence and prevalence of specific injuries that occur? I think that can be really important because it can equip you with a better idea of where the time loss is typically going to come from. Okay. Uh, but then, yeah, you got a question for me? Yeah. Uh, so um, you said two words and yes. um, sometimes I think they're, they're used um, as they have the similar meaning. Um, so you said incidents prevalent. So hold that thought, but 
briefly, could you define incidents, injury, in, the incidence of injury, or and then what is prevalence? Yeah, so the prevalence is uh, at any given moment. So right now, how many of those individuals or athletes, let's say within your co cohort or within a given demographic, have an injury? And then the incidence is the rate at which you might see an injury occur. So the hamstring, for example, uh, there is a high incidence, meaning uh, the rate at which the hamstring injury or hamstring uh, strain occurs is quite high. Uh, it has been for, for a while in a lot of sports, but then the prevalence could also be high as well, where currently in this particular span of time, there are this many athletes that have a, a, a hamstring injury. Sorry to interrupt, but I, that that's important to hear. Thanks. And then, um, so you were on your first big thing talking about incidents and prevalence. Yeah, I think I think I think, I think crazy numbers right now. By the way, so <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think that part is important to establish within, and maybe uh, for me to get a little bit more information too. It sounds like for every sport or team, there's like this uh, group of individuals or stakeholders that are tasked with the performance, the health, and, and the health, not even just physical, but mental uh, at UAL's university uh, within, within that cohort of athletes. And so it's like, well, determining what injuries are typically uh, going to be present for, for those athletes or for that sport can be helpful uh, for one. And I wanna like slightly veer off a little bit and say, sometimes, the I think what happens is because, you know, I speak through like this lens of being a PT. And so it's OK, well, we're trying to reduce the maybe reduce injury and give these protective affordances. And so that at times, I think, is is counter to what a strength coach might say and say, hey, we're trying to bestow these qualities that improve their performance. But I don't think that those things have to be divergent. I think both of them, they converge on similar uh, characteristics, similar types of, of uh, qualities that we're trying to derive for, for the athletes. And so I don't want it to seem as though those are oppositional types of things. I think health and performance uh, can, can be done simultaneously. Um, so with that being said, uh, we have that route that I think could be beneficial within the, the college level. But then I also think that having these, uh, and maybe you already do this, but maybe to Ted's point, like having these very deliberate meetings and look, I know depending on the team, especially for football, that can be really challenging of like, are we going to, we're going to have our group meet with each person, uh, you know, every, every two to three weeks, that can be kind of time consuming and quite quite challenging as well. Uh, so to me, it might be more of like a, well, can we make a, 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 a document, right? Just using technology, send that out and have specific questions that we ask or we have the, the athletes fill out. And those questions can be pertaining to like, yes, the, the medical uh, injury history and the, the medical intake, but more specifically of what types of, of training have you been exposed to? What type of training do you prefer? Uh, what what do you prefer in the training room with the physical therapist? Things of that nature. What are you looking forward to? Um, I think that could be somewhat helpful as, as well. So maybe those are my two biggest suggestions because now you're getting the athlete's perspective. You're getting their buy-in. You can establish rapport, but then you're also having some objectivity to uh, the creation and formulation of a, of a physical preparation plan that pertains to injury, but understanding that by trying to reduce injury, you're bringing along the physical qualities that increases their preparedness. Yeah. What do you all do now? Let me... Um... Before you answer that one, I want to, uh, you know, Jerry, your background is PT, physical therapy. And today's physical therapy in sport is a little bit different than what some people might uh, think it is. Uh, but I think after listening to you, they will have a better idea of what today's physical therapists do. And 
the title of this podcast is Research to Reps Roundtable. And I have a case study because I want you to get more granular. And okay. you we've talked about it. Um, Ernie brought up um, and Ernie brought it up his baseball career. And um, a few weeks ago, and then prevalence and incidents, um, there was a hamstring injury um, at the 40 plus baseball league. And um, one of my teammates, one, one of his teammates. And I just want to know what does the research show about hamstrings? And I know you can go down a rabbit hole on hamstrings, but but people really that's like the first question people want to know if a physical therapist uh, can answer is, you know, what can you do to help with this hamstring injury and what can you do or advice can you give so that these types of injuries uh, don't happen? Yeah. So, yeah. I, I like that question. And uh, I'll try, <laughs> I'll try my best to be uh, succinct here because I've really been thinking about this actually quite a bit recently uh, for whatever reason, just reading a lot of hamstring literature and listening to, to different individuals who have a lot of domain expertise on hamstrings. And everyone has, even those who are at the top of the game and have a PhD in hamstring uh, performance and injury, they all kind of have a subtle difference in how they approach trying to reduce and attack hamstring uh, injury. And to me, and this applies to everything. I'm, I'm definitely going to answer your question, but this is like what I want to say. My philosophy with the hamstring applies to a lot of things, and that when I'm looking at research, I used to kind of look at the dissimilarities a lot with different studies. And now what I try to do is look more at what are the commonalities and similarities? Because to me, if I can pinpoint those, then that gets me, I think, closer to the truth of, well, what is, what is the quote unquote principle that applies to this thing that I'm trying to an analyze or the question that I'm trying to answer? So for hamstrings, there's a lot of different camps that say, oh, we need to do eccentric training. Uh, and that gets down a, no, a whole other rabbit hole as well. Well, what is eccentric training? And there's so many different methods as, as well, but we need to do eccentric training. Maybe we can do Nordic hamstring exercises. That's going to protect the hamstring. Or, well, we really just need to be mindful of how we dose uh, sprinting and max velocity sprinting in and making sure that we expose them to those uh, velocities at a frequent uh, rate because that's going to be the most protective. Or, well, we really just need to load the, the glutes because maybe the glutes are not sufficient. So we don't have uh, sufficient uh, uh, ability to dampen, if you will, the demand on the hamstring complex, particularly biceps femoris uh, long head. So there's so many different types of, of, of camps that are out there. And to me, it's, well, the thing that matters the most is we need to have exposure consistent exposure to high force or high magnitude uh, strength, uh, strength stimuli. And we need to have some type of consistent exposure to high speed running are gonna be my big things. And the big thing there is the consistency, right? So making sure that when someone is, is, is exposed to a hamstring injury, to your point, is this because of the fact that there was, they, they've exceeded their tissues tolerance level or envelope of function, so to speak. So what I mean is like that bandwidth where the tissue has been exposed to this, has the capacity to handle it. Well, maybe it doesn't and we've exceeded that. And why have we exceeded it? Well, because it was perhaps not prepared to handle it. Uh, and so to me, it's the consistency at which we're exposing it to a stress and then making sure that that stress is checking the box of something eccentric. The something eccentric is similar to uh, the mechanism, more or less, of the hamstring strain. And then the other part is, instead of getting bogged down on, oh, is it the glute max that isn't sufficient? Is it the adductor magnus that isn't sufficient? 
I just look at it as let's let's have a comprehensive capacity, so a holistic approach to the thigh musculature and the posterior chain. So hitting your Copenhagen's, hitting your Nordic uh, hamstring exercises, hit it, hitting your uh, seated uh, hamstring curls, hitting your single leg RDLs. Now, obviously, that's a lot. We have to filter it through the athlete and say, well, what are their constraints? Meaning, what are the things that might not make that exercise the best vehicle to drive that adaptation? Um, but I think something comprehensive can be important and vital to establishing a robust uh, thigh musculature. Uh, and again, the 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 high speed uh, running as well, making sure that well their first time running hasn't been well. I've taken I've taken two weeks off, and now I'm gonna you know play in this softball game, and I got a sprint, and I haven't done that in in ages. So I've overwhelmed that tissue's capacity to handle that high magnitude, uh, high elite position, and that's where. Uh, I have some degradation in, in the tissue. So that would be my, my big thing is, is looking at the commonalities amongst all the, the research and, and saying, okay, well, we need to stress it and we need to stress it frequently without having a lot of peaks and valleys. And it can come from local stress because it has a high potency uh, within that tissue to change the, the, the architecture and the morphology, which can be protective. But then we also do the emergent thing, which is sprint. Um, and I think that will help out with creating a little bit more of like this robust signature for the hamstring. Very thorough. That was good. That was good. I know you were, um, I interrupted you. You were going to ask us, what do we do at um, our present university at Louisville? And I would, I would say um, with 23 sports and 650 athletes, um, there's a lot going on. There's um, the amount of sports medicine staff, 20 plus full-time athletic trainers, uh, probably 15 or so strength and conditioning, sports performance, um, six or seven sports nutrition, um, a growing sports science department, and a, um, a, a, um, a pretty good mental health and mental performance department. So getting all of these areas to an I would say our mental health and mental performance, the scale, the, the numbers that we have and what we're able to do now is, is a lot different than in the past. And then uh, sports science wise, um, that department being at the table at the, uh, at the helm of uh, Dr. Reimer is a lot different as well than maybe just two years ago. So I think we're, it's something that's continuing to evolve and grow and we're having these conversations, these health and performance meetings around each sport where uh, the the team doctor, um, you know, maybe two years ago wasn't um, attending the health and performance meetings at, at each sport. So now we, we have that going on. So it's evolving, it's growing. Um, and I know Ernie can speak in a lot more detail than I can. Yeah, I mean... Um... Gosh, there's so many things that fly through my mind there, but like what I love about collegiate athletics and what Dr. Ivy shared is you know, we don't like, I, I totally agree with you, Jared, that like this idea of like evidence informed is so important because every, every group uh, like health and performance team for every sport like there, there's a, a, an experiential and a subjective or an artistic aspect to the work that bonds with the evidence in the, the culture of the program and, and stuff. And so like you, you may have in, in collegiate athletics, we have a unique problem where a strength coach is going to be assigned to multiple teams. And I, I know this is true for me and it's, it's true for other strength conditioning coaches, but their methodology and their approach and the things they're trying to deliver can completely vary from one sport to another purely based off of kind of the culture of that health and performance unit, that the culture of that team and that, that coaching staff and, and the evidence at hand. So it's really amazing to kind of get to move from sport to sport and observe these differences and experience them myself. One thing I, I really love about like collegiate athletics is that 
when you have such a large health and performance unit, you know, there, there's so much different levels of experience and education in each area, in each discipline. So like Dr. Ivy said, we have those six disciplines and you have someone who's entry level first year on, you know, first full-time job ever. And you have people who've been in the business for a long time with tons of experience. And, and so I love that across every discipline, there, there's people that you can coach and you can mentor. This is referring to the staff. There's people that can be your sounding board and, and people you can bounce ideas off of. And then there's also people who can coach you and mentor you. And it's so just, it's so fascinating because like, I feel like I, I have people I can coach in each one of our disciplines. I have people that I can really like, you know, serve as a sounding board or, or a confidant. And then there's also people in each discipline who, who operate as a bit of a coach and a mentor for me. So, um, so I guess one question I might have for you is kind of moving this idea of like being able to coach or be coached in, in the MBA environment, um, you know, how, who are your mentors and who, who coaches you and, and who do you seek mentorship from and whether that be inside the organization or outside? Yeah, I, I would say, which is incredibly, incredibly important uh, to be able to have that because we have so many blind spots. And we have so many unknown unknowns. Uh, I would say that I have two distinct uh, mentors. One is our head of sports medicine. So that's Eric Otter, who really is the head of all of our departments. Uh, and and he's, he's brilliant. And so he's a confidant and a coach and a mentor for me, particularly in my position right now as director of, of rehabilitation. So he helps to just keep me oriented or nudge me towards, uh, towards readings and resources that will allow me to maximize my potential to then therefore maximize the potential of the other physical therapists that I help to manage. Uh, and then another one outside of here, because I do think it's important to have a, a mentor that's maybe removed from the immediacy of the organization as well, because they can just bring another level of, of insight and maybe be have, be removed from 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 some some bias, uh, and that is uh, Eric Mayer, and, and he he he's been incredibly just insightful as well and helpful at orienting me towards things that might be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more, I would say relevant to what I need to be focused on. Because again, like I talked about earlier, you get inundated with so much information, and or you know you start reading on a particular subject that is relevant to an athlete's case, but then it's like, oh, well, this is interesting. And then you kind of go down a different rabbit hole. And so having the mentors helps, at least for me, to keep me on track uh, and, and find those those blind spots a little bit. Um, but I think, it, I do think that it's, it's incredibly important. And, and, and even, it's so like you have, and I don't know how you all feel, but you might have like a very, self-appointed and designated mentor that's more formal in nature, but you might have other individuals who might not be formal mentors, but you can still receive such amazing insight from them. And that could be from people who don't even have the the, the years that you have or the experience that you have. And I, I try to make sure that I approach uh, most of my interactions with someone as someone who wants to listen and receive and learn from that individual even the other pts that i do manage i'm going into those conversations and our one-on-one -on -one meetings with the mindset of i'm going to learn something and extract something from them that could be valuable for me to then pour back into them so how can i be better uh what what do you need from me and all of those interactions help me grow and help me learn i don't i don't know if you, you all feel feel the same same way when you're approaching those those conversations ted i would agree yeah you need somebody inside and you need somebody on the outside for sure different perspectives and um the the the, uh, the other thing i wanted to add, uh a lot of times people have asked 
going from college to the professional ranks. And they would ask me, you know, what piece of advice? And my advice is read the collective bargaining agreement. Um, <laughs> and people would say, why? I go, you'll be surprised that there's certain constraints or that you wouldn't think would, would be in it, but they are. So you want to make sure you are aware of what uh, things that uh, you may have to navigate during the course of a year when situations pop up. Um, certain teams, if a player is suspended from the league at a time, you can't interact with them. Uh, other professions, you can. So it's I think those details, if you have like a checklist of, all right, if this happens, this is how we're going to navigate that. And, and what's your uh, feelings on that? Yeah, I like that. And and just to clarify, Ted, is, is maybe your question of what are things that are pertinent for people who are trying to pursue a career in the NBA? Yes. Yeah, I I like what you brought up. And, and one of the things that I think is incredibly important in addition to that is we don't have to have expertise in every domain. And I think sometimes that's where people who I talk to are trying to get in. It's like, okay, what do I need to read? And I'm trying to learn about force plates. I'm trying to learn about isokinetics, but then, you know, I need to learn about tendinopathy, but also need to learn. About, it's like, you don't, you don't have to be a domain expert in every single thing. What I do think is important is to just have a very strong fundamentalist uh, perspective and a, and, a, and a strong, solid foundation and what I mean by, by foundation is uh, having having the competency of at a basal level physics and physiology and biomechanics and not necessarily the like nitty gritty minutia if you will even psychology I'm not a psychologist at all but you know having a degree of EQ or this emotional intelligence is incredibly important that maybe the center of of importance because everything else doesn't really matter if you're not able to have the relationships, the rapport, and, and build that trust with the athletes or the student athletes in UL's case. And so to me, it's you know getting less bogged down into trying to learn every single thing to the nth degree and more so just be, being really confident in your competence about the fundamentals uh, and the foundational constituents of what makes a human uh, become a, a high performer within their respective uh, sport and or a student, a student athlete. Um, and I don't know if some of that, you know, too, is I guess it's easy to say, oh, well, a lot of this happens because of social media now. And there's so many like novel, just unique training types of methods and means out there uh, and people, you know, get really they get really excited by seeing these unique novel types of, of of interventions uh and i think you can get lost in the weeds and maybe forget the the foundational elements of of training and performance and and health in general um i don't want to blame it on social media only because i do think that it, it comes with a lot of, of benefit as well but it's probably incumbent on the user to be intentional about who they're following and what information they're receiving. So I know it's a little tangential, but it's just something that I think is incredibly important, especially for people who are looking to get into to, to high performance. It's like you see things that you might think are high performance, uh, but they, they, they really might not be. It might be kind of, for lack of a better word, like superfluous types of, of training uh, that doesn't really move the needle. Have you all have you all seen that? Maybe yeah, or, or any uh, like what is your because especially for you know like interns, right? Like uh, I'm sure you all have have maybe GAs or interns that come in. Uh, I don't know if if that is something that you're getting a lot in the sports science uh, world as well. I'm sure for uh, strength and conditioning internships, uh, that's something that's, that's prevalent. But do you do you run across that or interface with that much? Uh, kind of what I alluded to. All the all the time, all the time. And um, I think we're all guilty of it in our careers. And, and part of me thinks that that's why we need sports science is um, when your question 
becomes the answer before you've answered the question, that's a problem. And and let me let me make this in practical terms. Like, um, okay, I've got this new training method. My friend taught it to me, um, and I'm just like out with the old, in with the new. I've never actually evaluated the old program, but this is exciting. It's new. It's it's a different way of doing things. And now I'm going to preach that to a coach. I'm going to preach that to my peers. I'm going to preach it to the athletes. We're going to do it. But now what I've been preaching, what I believe becomes the better training program when we've never stopped to evaluate the effectiveness. I think you said it earlier, like, does the stimuli elicit the adaptations you expect? And, and I think we are all so guilty of like implementing these programs and these interventions. And, and we don't actually stop to say like, this actually elicited the outcome we were hoping for. And often, so so the question or the promise of a better training program becomes a better training program before we've stopped to check and evaluate if it is, or the question becomes the answer before we've answered the question. I think that's like one of the biggest risks that we have as practitioners. Oh yeah, it's, it reminds me of uh, this term epistemology, where epistemology essentially is um, like how you how you formulate your beliefs what do your beliefs uh mm. depend on and where do they come from and sometimes i feel like uh oftentimes people's beliefs are grounded in well this person who i regard as being an expert uh or who i have a you know close proximity with a friendship they're doing this thing so now my belief shifts and changes and i'm going to adopt like their philosophy without even truly trying to like dissect that philosophy to determine if it actually is fundamentally uh true or if it's credible and if it fits into the model within my culture thank you for oh, okay. For helping clarify what I was trying to describe. I mean, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I I I I understood what you were saying. No, I was, yeah, we're we're definitely we're definitely on the on the same page page with it. And again, it's something that um, I'm I'm not saying that I I have been able to 100% omit uh, within kind of how I practice, but at least being aware of it is probably a good step in the right direction of trying to temper it. As, as much as possible. You know, with the demands of being in the NBA, the travel schedule and so, uh, so forth, what advice do you give somebody to help manage work-life balance? Mm. Yeah, so I have a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. good. though no, I like that a lot because I, I think that the answer I will give might be somewhat unpopular to it and that I, and it might be unpopular to my wife too. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, so I, I don't really look at work, life, and then balance. Um, and what I mean by that, the balance part is I, I, I kind of try to approach things with this mindset and perspective of there are seasons, if you will, or there are chapters within this 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 book of life or this book of your career, if you will, and certain chapters uh, might be longer than others um, because they take up more, they require more time. Uh, the story or that section is just a little bit longer. So what I mean by that is right now, uh, or, or right at the start of the uh, the off season, that chapter was really me uh, having a lot of time to give to an athlete for their post-surgical reconditioning rehabilitation. Um, so it, I couldn't really call it, you know, balancing work and life to make it them 50-50. Cause I think when people say balance, they often mean, oh, well, it has to be 50 here and 50 there. But sometimes the season uh, of life or the chapter within, again, the totality of, of your life doesn't afford you the ability to do that. But what I'm always mindful of is, okay, this is something that's going to be transient and rather acute. And I know that the next chapter can be dedicated to something else like, all right, now I have more time to then give 
to my wife and I could be even more deliberate about making sure that um, we're, we're having commitments to where, you know, we, we might go on dates uh, while we are in market and not traveling a lot, or I don't have a rehab to, to perform. And so by setting the expectations, giving uh, for yourself and for significant others or your family, I think that helps a lot. Uh, and then also with those expectations, just being mindful that there are going to be times where there is some turbulence and it's like, all right, well, I'm going to have to wait this a little bit more because it is urgent. And again, it's just this transient type of, of, of thing that's happening and it won't last for forever. And once that chapter closes, I go on to the next and maybe that's where I can allocate a little bit more time towards uh, other things in life. And so I think maybe that's where the balance comes uh, as opposed to, okay, I did this for this much time. Now I have to then give the same amount of time to to another uh, factor in life. I think it becomes really challenging to to do that. So that's just my approach. And uh, yeah, it might be unpopular because I, I do think that people tend to approach it with, with you know, this 50-50 work-life balance to, to a T. Um, but how, yeah, what does that look like at the, at the collegiate level? Because I'm sure, you know, it's like you all have a lot of, of, of work as well, responsibilities and tasks and projects, but perhaps the, you know, the travel isn't 82 games a week. You know, and then, or excuse me, eight two games a year, three or four uh, games a week, and then you go into the playoffs as well, and then you're you know traveling all the way across the country. Jared, I think we might have to pick that one up on podcast number two, because <laughs> I I think we were uh, Ted opened up another door with that question, so um, we're we're going to wrap this one up. Um, Ted, I know you had a question for final question for Jared. Yeah, Jared, you, you've already mentioned one, uh, recommended one book to our listeners. What would be some other uh, reading materials that you would recommend? Mm, yeah, uh, another great one was, is that I've read, and I've kind of gone back through it intermittently, is The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, uh, how to determine what's fake, you know, how to determine what's real in a world uh, increasingly full of fake. I believe that's kind of the subtitle, but it's called the, Ske the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Absolutely, like, unbelievable book, just with respect to the cognitive biases. That's something that I'm super interested in that we uh, fall privy to. Uh, so I really enjoy, I really enjoy that. Uh, and then another really great book uh, th that I thought was influential with respect to not only just the human performance side of things, but giving you like this holistic view of, of like life, um, I would say would be in, in leadership too, if you will, um, would price, it's two of them, but I'll give you, I'll give you one. And it was called the, the ape that understood the universe. Uh, that one was, was fantastic because it's a lot about evolution, life, uh, how human characteristics kind of evolved. And while it doesn't directly pertain to performance, there's kind of byproducts uh, that are within that book that I think are, are, are quite unique and super, super interesting. So they definitely help to maybe shift my uh, thought process just, just a little bit more. So those would be some of, some of the few, but I could keep going if you want, but I'll just I'll just go with those two for for right now. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Well, this hour has flown by. Um, we appreciate you so much. We know with all your travels and your schedule um, to be able to grab an hour of your time, we are um, humbled, honored uh, to uh, continue to get to know you better. You are so impressive as a person, as a professional. And I hope our paths continue to cross and we stay in touch. Uh, any closing remarks from anyone? Well, I'll say that um, my friend, the baseball player, probably gets a lot of sprint exposure. Probably like start lifting some more weights, honestly. 
and maybe some eccentric training in there too. Just throwing that out there. It's a good idea. I'm sure uh, your friend will listen to this podcast. Mm, probably. And uh, when it, it is football season, but when it's basketball season, I promise we'll be cheering for you. I love that. I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. The more fans, the better, especially <laughs> for a small market team. So we, we, we'll love that. And I appreciate you all for having me on. This is a great conversation. That hour definitely did fly by. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you all have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.